and AIA Australia, helping your clients in their time of need is our number one priority. In 2016, we paid over $1.15 billion in claims to both retail and group members. That's over $4.5 million every working day. To offer your clients cover you can trust, chat to your AIA CDM today. Welcome to XY Life for this week. Uh, today we've got Chris Hockey. Uh, he's going to talk about how to build a national advice firm from a one-man practice. So going from where I am into a national uh, business. So super excited. Uh, just before we get cracking, I uh, just want to talk about the Facebook group. It is going at gangbusters. We've got 850 plus people in there, I think, 850 plus. Um, yeah, we'll well, it will be by the end of this week. Um, and <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about it last night. Not too many places in this industry do we get um, some, some big dogs talking about some industry issues. So we had a conversation uh, yesterday about volume bonuses and, you know, lots of people from FBA, AFA kind of weighing in and, and having a discussion, you know, a, a real discussion about uh, real issues in our industry. So uh, it's a place to be. If you're not in the Facebook group, make sure you get in the Facebook group. Also, any of those avid podcast listeners, XYLive is on podcast. You can get it on iTunes and Stitcher. Uh, and we've got a Melbourne event coming up on the 14th of September. Uh, most people um, are coming down. There's so many people coming down from Sydney to join in. Um, so if you're in Melbourne or even near Melbourne or if you're even in Perth, fly over, get to the event. Uh, so it's going to be great, 14th of September. So just want to quickly also say thanks to our supporters at AIA for making this happen. Let's get stuck into it, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Give us an idea of what your business is and uh, what's the name of the business. Oh, well, firstly, thanks for having me. Um, I'm loving being a part of the Expo Advisor uh, group, particularly the Facebook group, and a little bit jealous, actually. Wish it was a, that sort of resource was around when I was first starting out. So glad yeah. to be a part of it. And uh, who am I? Well, I own a business called Innovative Financial Solutions. Um, we have offices in Brisbane, uh, which is where I'm predominantly based, but on the Gold Coast, Melbourne, and a satellite office, which is growing in Sydney as well. Awesome. So, yeah, I just want to say thank you for being a part of the group. I know you and Michael are quite uh, involved in what's going on in the Facebook group. So thank you. Um, give us an idea about where you started in business. So when did you start? How did you start? Uh, I started the practice on my own in 2009. Um, very much with the focus on i had been a bank planner for about seven years. And um, I started when I was 22, so which was a little bit different. Um, back in those days, it was a lot more grey hair in our industry uh, when I first started, so it was a bit of an anomaly. But I really got to a stage where I, I wanted to deliver advice in a particular way. I wanted to do uh, goals-based outcomes for clients. I wanted to build long-term relationships with clients. I did want to be product-focused. And I also wanted to deal with clients under 55 as well. So that was the main reason for starting the business back in 2009. Fantastic. So any, everyone who's watching, make sure you just ask questions. Not too, many, uh, not too often do we get someone who's uh, started off uh, just by themselves and grown to multiple offices, uh, you know, done purchasing, done mergers. So we're going to discuss all of those things today. Um, but Chris, next question, how big is your business today? So we've got four advisors um, and plenty of support staff sitting behind that, which is great. Um, we have about 800 active clients. Uh, wow. We probably onboard two to 300 new clients a year. So wow. um, that I think is a testament to the appetite out there for the sort of advice that we're giving, but perhaps which is a bit different to some of the people that might have been watching it. They're sort of just starting out over the last couple of years, giving that type of advice, but we're perhaps an example over a bit more of an extended period of time that, there's a lot of those people out there um, and they're really hungry for the right type of advice. So um, yeah, that's a, that's the size of our business at the moment. Yeah. Wow. So 200 to 300 clients, are they, are they all active clients? Cause you, you said you've got no. 800 active clients. Yeah. So we, by the nature of particularly with the wealth accumulator, one of the best things I did in the early stages was segment the type of advice that we give. And what I mean by that is in an ongoing perspective, coming from a bank world, it was all about getting into product and all about that ongoing revenue for the bank. And I'd be doing reviews for clients 
where I was just not really adding any value. They were passive in their nature. You know, you're 80 year old and a pension super um, in index or multi manager funds. What are you really adding value to in some scenarios? So it was really liberating in the early days to uh, only charge a fee if I was doing work for a client. As silly as that sounds, uh, my, my hairdresser can do it, so maybe I can too. Um, and that was great. So if we were sitting down with a client and we were doing some transactional work and they were, were charging a fee for that work, but really there was nothing right at that point in time uh, where there was a need for them to be paying money year in, year out and for us to be sitting down and reviewing, that was okay. Um, we do that transactional advice and put them in a segmentation that we still marketed to them and communicated to them and still wanted them to be in an environment where they're talking to their mates at a barbie. They say, oh, yeah, we're looked after by these guys. But there was no formal obligation. Um, so when we talk about active clients, they are the ones that go into an ongoing service relationship. Yeah, yeah. So just break down the, um, the new clients per year. How much would be um, going into just transactional, just once-off advice, and how many clients would be going into like an ongoing I reckon forty percent of our clients go into an ongoing relationship. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's still huge volume um, for most businesses. Yeah, um, yeah. And we would then move a good chunk of those clients that fall on that sixty percent, and not having done the complete numbers of it, maybe it's a little bit less than that, um, into an ongoing advice relationship eventually when their situation warrants it. Yeah, yeah, when wow. yeah, their life lifestyle changes, or you know, when when they when they deem it necessary. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, how how are you growing? So, two to three hundred new clients a year. Um, how are you getting most of these clients? By referral. So we made a conscious decision to not hook our wagon to one big organisation or um, any hard and fast JV relationships. We've got a lot of businesses in a lot of different um, areas and industries that refer us business. One of the beautiful things about what we do as planners and giving that goals-based holistic advice is uh, where our niche is that we don't, we're sort of that general practice, the GP. So we're there looking after your average Australian, giving personal advice. We're not looking for high net worth. We're not looking for specific areas. Our area and niche is that we're general and, um, all about that bigger picture, personal goal achievement. So therefore, it's just about everybody, isn't it? So mm. it's not hard to have a conversation with the business to say, this is where we add value. So we get a lot of referrals in from various different businesses. And as we've grown over time, um, we're very deliberate in how we um, get referrals from our existing clients as well. Uh, for example, one of the great things that we've found that works well for us is asking a client for referral Year one review, we found that talking to them in those initial setup stages, you hadn't really proven yourself yet. By the time you get to year one and year two and you've established a strong relationship, we were having a great um, or well, much better outcome asking clients for referrals then with a little bit of a track record as well. Mm. And... Uh... Yeah. Okay. So with those referral partners, we've, we've done a few sessions on this in the past. So um, I guess how many referral partners do you have? Um, mm. and, Cause we've, we had Corey on, you know, a few months ago and he was saying he tried to, he went too broad in, in his referral networks. He had like five in each industry and that just kind of didn't work. He, now he's gone into one or two really good accountants who are referring. Is that how you guys have found it or having that bro, you know, wide net has really helped? The wide net has really helped and it's really basing each opportunity um, around the individual business. And there has to be something in it for both of you. And you have to come in genuinely talking about them first and where you can add value. Um, I know before we, we started talking on the Facebook Live, we're, um, offline we're having conversation about um, where we add that value um, as advisors and what we can see all the way through and then what we have to pass on to lawyers and accountants. And in our case, we don't have in-house lending, so let lenders as well. So those relationships are treated different to referral relationships. Um, 
because just somebody just because somebody wants to send us business and we can help their client doesn't miss necessarily mean they're exactly the right fit of where I'd send my estate planning all the time. Mm. So we individualize those a li little bit. And if that's not them, then we're making sure we're having that conversation. But that doesn't mean we can't add value to their business. And we need to just reassure risks like, well, yes, we refer elsewhere, but we segment and it clearly defines um, that the referral come from, came from you. And the conversation is very much around, well, by referring to us and educating them on our process. And we spend a lot of time educating them on what we do and why we do it is that it makes them feel more comfortable that we'll identify opportunities that they necessarily won't see because they're not as deep and talking as often to the, their clients as perhaps we are. So also you might just buy their sheer volume. They might only be giving you five or six a year. Mm. So that enables us to diversify as well in regards to the amount of referrals and not having to squeeze a referral source so tight because we need them to be sending us a certain amount of volume. They're just sending us the clients that are really good quality because that matches their volume and we've educated them enough to know what we do, why we do it and where they see the opportunities with their clients. Yeah, I guess uh, my, my follow-on question is about how much time are you spending with each referral source, like, you know, on a per month or per year basis? Because um, that's something that I've, I've never been great with external referrers. Um, I don't play very well with others. Um, so <laughs> I've always, and I've always been concerned with how much time um, I have to invest in that referral source because I've tried it in the past and invested a lot of time and it, it just didn't work. So um, how yeah. much time? It does vary business to business, but you do get a pretty good idea in the early stages, whether, and particularly the longer you do it, whether this is going to work or not. Um, you identify people that are running the sort of businesses that are going to um, actively refer to you. So once they, you do establish that relationship, a fair bit, but the interactions vary. So in those early stages, it's taking time for them to sit down and educate them on your process because... The, the reason people don't refer is fear. I remember as a bank planner, the reason a teller wouldn't ask for a referral is because they were scared they were going to get a question back and they didn't know the answer. So the more your referral source knows about what you do, the more confident they're going to be able to ask their clients the questions they need to to identify opportunities. But the short answer to your question, Phil, is in the early stages a lot and then it just peters back um, uh, over time and you find your client interactions back and forth tend to be where you're in, where you interact with your referral sources. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you said, uh, you did say, even if uh, you're not referring back to them, you still need to be adding value to their business. So how do you, how do you quantify that? Like, are you um, paying them for referrals or are you helping them in, you know, in growing their business, you know, through other, other ways, how are you adding value to those businesses? It's a bit like the conversations we have with our clients. You really need to sit on the other side of the desk and think about, well, what are, in their business, what's really important? Um, where are their risks? And a lot of the time it's, you know, building those fences around their clients and then uh, not being exposed to another planning practice or another business um, taking care of an opportunity and then stepping into their world and taking that client. So that tends to be a big motivator. Um, for clients, right. it's talking about the ongoing relationship and the fact that um, when you start talking and they say that they're <laughs> moving house and doing this and doing that, I've got a client at the moment that um, is buying a house and um, she's a widow going into a de facto relationship and all of a sudden all these opportunities come up and I'm pushing them back to the accountant, to the lawyer and we've got to get this work done and they would never have known that that was happening because they haven't got that ongoing relationship. So they see the value in the business coming back as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. So I know, um, you know, you've merged businesses before. So give us a sense of how that was. What was, uh, things that you might have done differently, you know, now that, you know, I, I know that you and Michael, uh, are equal partners in the business. Is that, is that right? Yeah, so I suppose things that we would have done differently, I'm kind of lucky that we nailed it the first time. So yeah. we did a lot of things right, either by accident or by design, a bit of both, I suppose. But the reason it's gone so well is because we kept our eye on the things that were most important. And to go back with a bit of history that um, 
as I grew my uh, business, I never set out to have a business that was just me. I always wanted to succession plan. Um, I always wanted to be more than just me for a couple of reasons. Um, it's better for the value of my business. Um, my dad built a business, a relatively successful one, but it was just him and he got sick before his time and left work early and got bugger all for it. And that always stuck in my mind. I said, well, if I'm going to build a business from a saleable asset point of view, it, will, it needs to be more than just me. Um, second reason, it was going to give me the ability to advance my career beyond just being an advisor. Um, and scale and growth were important. And as our industry's grown, that's become really, really important. It's just more fun doing it with somebody else and doing it with a, a team. That's kind of my background, whether it be sport or otherwise, it's, it's just more fun. So that was, that was what drove me to succession plan. And then it's about finding the right person and the right fit. And Michael, my now business partner, was running a business on the Gold Coast where we also had an office at that stage. And over time, talking, realised that we're having the same issues in regards to scale and being that one-man band and hitting the ceiling with clients and where, how do we continue to grow and professionally achieve the things we want to achieve. In his case, there's no one better at getting out there, getting clients in the door and sitting down in front of clients than Michael. And that's purely just what he wants to focus his energy on, whereas I was on a bit of a different journey to change our advice process, grow our business, talk about our back office processes. So there was a nice synergy there. But the bigger picture part was what was most important. We both agreed where we wanted to take an advice business our ethics were the same. Um, culture was really important. And hanging on to that bigger picture stuff, and yes, as you said, we equalised out, which was from um, people we involved in the process, some of the best advice we got because decision-making since then has just been so easy because you're all in for a penny, in for a pound, as the old saying goes. Mm. So all the detail that followed off the back of that as you put these things together, um, just kept referencing back to being that alignment in the bigger picture um, and made it an easy process. And then about three or four years ago, we brought Michael's business in and um, we've never looked back. So how long were you guys, were you guys working together at all before you merged or had, had a, what, what was the process? Uh, we were under the same license. That's, uh, and you know, like all of us, meet at a conference, have a chat, um, complain about the same things. Uh, yeah. And it was just, from my perspective in particular, I always had that mindset of, of partnership and always an interest in other advisors. Um, and then after a conversation with Michael, Penny dropped for me that he might be somebody that would be worth having a centered conversation. And that was 12 months of, you know, lots of whiteboard SWOT analysis and, and chats to get to where we got to. Uh, mm. But that's how it started. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's great. Well, Michael's actually asked the question, uh, has he? Uh, absolutely spot on in the merger scale and growth. We're very important. Thanks, Michael. Uh, it's good that you're tuning in to your business partners session. Making, <laughs> Only saying nice things, man. Only saying nice <laughs> things. <laughs> um, all right. That's, uh, yeah. So uh, just in terms of, I want to get into the money side of things. We all work in money and I love talking about money. So and don't give us the exact details about it, but um, I'm presuming one of the businesses was bigger. Did you just, in terms of equaling out uh, uh, the business, did you just go basic market rates? One business is bigger than the other. Uh, so you, you know, one, one business owner pays the other, the difference is that, is that how you work? Yeah. The first thing that's really important in any acquisition is to agree on valuation methodology. You know, that's, that's what it comes down to. Then the numbers are the numbers. So mm. if you sit down and agree on this is the right way to value a business, then it all works itself out um, from that point. In any succession plan, in any merger, you've got to give up something. And it, and it, it might be financial. Um, it might be duties. It's uh, responsibilities. Ego gets in the way of a lot of this stuff. So if uh, go back to that bigger picture um, part that if you focus on that, yeah, everyone gives a bit, gets a bit in the initial process, but everybody wins in the big end if you keep reminding yourself that's the reason that you were doing it. And Michael and I often have conversations that I oh, can't really remember a lot of this, 
detailed conversations that we had in those early stages because it all just made sense and we're all focused on the big picture. And getting other people involved to give you good advice is, you know, sounds like an obvious thing being an advisor, but when you're getting these things done, you only know what you know and um, sometimes you're doing it for the first time, but also every time is different. Getting people around you to help you make informed decisions is really important as well. And then, and also just around the roles and responsibilities, was it, was before you guys decided on the merger, when you were discussing, did you realize that actually Michael loves doing stuff that I hate doing and, and, and vice versa? Um, Michael was saying, well, Chris is just loves doing the things that I hate doing within my business. So um, dividing roles and responsibilities was easy in that sense. It was easy and really important and a big basis for why we did it in the first place. Mm. Um, I think if you're looking, sitting there going, who do I partner with now? Anybody listening to this? Skill set's really important, but a slightly different skill set from yours is um, really advantageous. Um, there's, Michael, there's things that Michael is awesome at that um, I'm not. And there's parts that of the business that I was really interested in that Michael um, wanted to step away from so he could focus on other parts. So that synergy there was really important and works well for us every day. I mm -hmm. suppose being really transparent about that after the fact is also really important in any role within the business, being clear on who does what and what the outcome is. But particularly for me, because I do plenty of client work, but I was moving more into the bigger picture business stuff. And that's hard to um, record and, you know, um, track and talk about how those things are going compared to an advisor. And mm. that's something that, you know, through our constant conversations, we, we, we've got to be mindful of to compare, well, you're contributing to the business in this way and you're contributing in that way and everyone's pulling their weight and doing their thing. Yeah. And do you guys, you guys live in different states? Is that right? No, Michael's on the Gold Coast. I'm in Brisbane. So we're, we're both Queenslanders. Um, but when I go down the coast, it does feel like another planet sometimes. But um, no, we're both in Queensland. Um, we've got another advisor on the coast and we've got an advisor in, in Melbourne who also is looking after Sydney as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, we won't hold it against you guys being in Queensland. Um, so, <laughs> uh, and uh, you also mentioned that you've uh, also purchased some, um, you know, some businesses in the past along, along the growth. Um, what was the, what was the reason for doing that? Well, growth and referrals. So that it was as simple as that. We knew what we did was great and different. Um, and we want to get in front of as many people as possible. Um, I'm 39. I'm the youngest person, oldest person in the business, Freudian slip. Um, and so we, well, there was plenty of time in the game and we're all about growth. So we didn't actually buy businesses. We bought client registers. And yep. um, I'd done a lot of research and been around a lot of businesses that had purchased books of clients or other businesses. And what were the risks? What well, were the reasons why they didn't work. And we really thought about, well, why are we doing it? Well, it's not just about an, uh, an additional income source, it was about opportunities. So we needed to buy books of clients that had the sort of clients that we wanted to talk to, but the opportunity to deliver some advice to. Mm. And then we realized that those were risk books. Um, they were the average age client that we wanted to talk to. They were a lot more clients for the revenue, so it washed away that risk with a bit of diversification there. If a client's dropped off, then it wasn't losing 20% of your revenue. Mm. They were pretty passive, markets up and down, they're not ringing you in a panic, they're not asking for information. So I didn't have to build extra staff behind just to manage it. But we would be able to talk to these clients and get um, great opportunity, and it was particularly where they would come from perhaps an advisor, older advisor doing things a bit differently, that we could talk to these clients, get in front of them and really add so much value and do what we do. And that's what it was all, that's what it was all about. But where a lot of people I'd seen had struggled in the past is that they'd focus on it being an income thing and a revenue and they never thought about what happens once they've got it. We were very deliberate and still to this day about, well, now we've got that, What's our process? People calling on renewal. 
What are they saying? How are we getting in front of these clients? Um, and that's where we've had the success from. Are you finding it uh, difficult to go from buying a, a registry where there are risk clients where they may not have had a phone call from their advisor, you know, in years? Are you finding it difficult for to have that type of a client and then say, hey, we're going to do goals-based advice, you know, tell us all about your, you know, everything you want to achieve in life? Are you finding that hard? Well, no. And I suppose it's recognising that that's an issue. Uh, one of the fortunate things I've had in my career is before I was an advisor, I was, um, while I was studying, I was in corporate sales for a couple of years. So twice a week, every week, all I did was soft skills and language, soft skills and language. And that was my background. And when I came over to financial planning, I realised that was my advantage in the early days. So in our business, we spend a lot of time in being really good in the language we use and the way that we essentially sell our services and the value. I mean, that's the difference between being a planner and other professions is that we need to spend the first 20 minutes of our conversation with clients explaining what we do and why there's value in doing our service. It's not ingrained in people, particularly of our age bracket. So we spend a lot of time working on that. And yeah, it was a little bit of an advantage as opposed to a disadvantage that these clients were a bit disengaged and perhaps in legacy products. So we would go out of our way to point it out and there were issues with perhaps the products that they've got or their situation that they needed to address. And we weren't the old ones, we're the new ones. And there's an opportunity for us to provide some solutions there. But you have to go out of your way to personalise where those risks are for that client and do it quickly and in a way that they understand it so you can follow in with the solutions. Mm. And Clay, I'll let you jump in any time. I've got like about a thousand questions. Clay is, the best thing about XY Live is we can run this from anywhere. Just go over to you, Clay. Where about are you? And why are you looking a bit tired and, and worse for wear? <laughs> I am in a, a place called Moine, uh, which is a little fishing village in Vietnam. I'm here for my partner's 30th. So, uh, so yeah, it, it is absolutely an advantage to be able to do it from anywhere in the world. But I, I, I've got a question uh, for you, Chris. Um, and, and this is sort of going back uh, uh, to what we are talking about before with referrals. Um, and, and I love you've nailed that piece of to get a referral partner, you come in and you say, um, oh, this is what I can do to offer your uh, business, you know, value by putting it, putting a, a, a wall around so you know where your clients are having these other discussions with. And so we can, you, you, we can help you control that. Um, that's obviously not the best opening line though. So when, when you pick up, when you pick up the phone uh, and say, get a accountant down the road um, what, and, and you sit down with a coffee, when you're having that conversation, it, are you using um, examples or uh, I should say, are you using numbers? Are you sitting down and saying, look, if you can handle these, um, are you use, or is it literally just uh, getting the information in your head into theirs or is there something more formal? How, how do you, how do you it's have that? Too, it's meeting? not too dissimilar to a client interaction. It's sitting down and going, okay, well tell me a bit about your business. Um, what do you guys do? Right. And, you know, like, I'm doing now. Everyone loves talking about their business and I'm probably uh, yep. a very good example of that. And yeah, you know, where do you guys do? And there's probably something that connects you slightly. And I, I've heard this and tell me a bit about that and leading into your, the sort of clients that you see. And then the hamster starts running on the wheel and with enough experience, you sit back and you go, well, um, I know we could do this and know we could do that. I know we could do that. And you start talking about, where you might want to um, be able to add value for their clients or where there's perceived risks. And, um, but it always starts about understanding them and their industry and where you fit as a planner within their industry. But it always mm. starts with them. And then that conversation starts. And then, then it comes around to, well, I think you would either A, be able to add great value to our clients, and I think we should explore mm. that more, or B, I think there might be an opportunity for us um, to add value to your clients, I would love an opportunity in the next couple of weeks to sit down and show you our process, show you what we do. Because you also want to stretch that interaction out. Phil, you were talking about before, how much do you talk to your referral partners? Don't just go in and try and nail it all within a 45-minute coffee chat. Talk about them. 
book them in for three weeks later, give them enough to add value to want to continue a conversation, come back, show them what you do, how you do, where you add value, and then start working towards where that might meet somewhere in the middle. Does that answer your and question? Then, yeah, that's great. And then um, in this course that I've done in the, in the past KPI, they, they've got this formula that says partnerships or what, you know, referral partners plus a gift equals leads. And so do you have any gift or do you have uh, anything whatsoever that you give to your referral partners that they can send out on your behalf, right? So you've, you, you've mm. done all this work to, to gain the trust and get your foot in the door. Are you then giving them something that they can hand on, on, on your behalf? No, nothing formal. Um, we okay. spend a lot of time just on that education piece and probably showing them where our resources are when they want to talk to clients and making it easy for them to refer. That's the biggest thing. If you've got them on board right. to refer, making it as easy as possible to refer, a gift or some um, information to pass on, I suppose those resources digitally sit there for them to use, whether it be our Facebook page, videos that we have, our website. So we pump that as part of the education process to our referral sources to them, um, mm. but nothing formalised, no. Okay. And, um, and Sorry, Clay, okay. go, mate. Sorry, Matt, I'm just hammer, hammering all the business pieces. So, um, so then with, uh, with clients, um, when, you're, when you're having that conversation with the, the risk clients and you're saying, uh, okay, it's time to, ha to renew your insurances, uh, are you prepping them? Or, oh, sorry, I guess my first question is, do you have a sales team that's making these calls for you or do you do them yourself and are they aware that things are drastically different before coming in or do they learn upon arrival? So, I mean, back in the day, it was us, um, but scale has um, meant that we've had to split that process up. Nobody's going to be able to sell the first appointment better than an advisor. But what we have is somebody outside of the advisor whose role it is to contact the client uh, and place a couple of key reasons as to why, uh, with their permission, they'd like us to do a little bit more research and get an advisor to contact them. So essentially mm -hmm. to warm up that process. And right. it's amazing how big the, uh, the rate is on, um, on that and putting referrals on, client, on our advisor's desk. And then the advisor, I mean, nobody's going to do anything unless there's something in it for them. So the advisor has the knowledge base to then just contact that client and take that a little bit further and say, well, um, I've noticed this and this about your situation and have a conversation and maybe pick up a couple of other things and give the client enough of a reason to take that further. And also the advisor's got the experience to talk to them and go, well, they're probably best where they are or... Um, let's, uh, we're not going to be able to add value and pre-vet that a little bit as well. Awesome. So someone else in the office, let's call them a support staff in some capacity, are, are making that cold call and just saying, hey, this is your insurances. Do you mind if we get a couple of extra bits of information for the advisor? The advisor then looks at it and goes, well, there's a 50% chance they can use my help. I'll talk to them individually. That then, let, let's say 50%, uh, there's nothing we can do. Excellent, stay where you are, blah, 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 blah. Or the other 50% come in, let's have a meeting, uh, and then the additional information is laid on top. And then through that process, then we start educating them on why it should be more than just the IP policy we're talking about. And to go back to the original phone call too, there's so much value in that call on its own. And that's something that we reinforce within the office. What are your contact details? This is who we are. So if anything comes up, we call it the old, um, if they win lotto theory. So we build a relationship, even though that's passive, that they now know that we're looking after that policy and we have all their details and we can communicate to them. So if their situation does change, they're aware of us um, mm -hmm. and that relationship there as well. So there's value in just that phone call, whether it leads to a lead or not. Yeah. Awesome. So I've got a question, what's next? Uh, what, what's in the pipe works? What are you thinking of doing? Are you thinking about getting rid of Michael? Um, <laughs> he's not doing, he's, no, he's, he's been away on holiday for six weeks and it was painful, so I'm happy he's back. So that's probably <laughs> not going to happen. Um, what is next? Well, we're spending a lot of time um, on our advice process and 
always trying to continue to evolve that to be the best that it can be. And that's really changing fast, as everybody knows, in the XY um, network. So we're wanting to make sure that it is easy for people to get advice, that it's easy for us to deliver the best possible advice that we can, and we're reaching as many people as possible. And off the back of living in that goals-based world for long enough now we realize that we're having such deep conversations with clients that how do we continue to achieve all their goals and add value not just in some of the areas we can see all the way through but the other areas we'll identify and refer off and some areas like health and lifestyle that we identify and then just leave that conversation open so how do we broaden our service offering to um, even slightly move away from finance and just be about uh, somebody's personal consultant to achieve their life goals. And by being um, a client of Innovative Financial Solutions, they've got access to um, things that other people wouldn't have and they're empowered to make informed decisions. So we're spending a lot of time in that space. Everyone, like everyone, efficiencies in the back office um, is a constant focus. And I suppose the reason for why we set the business up in the, the first place and the why we've ended up in multi-site is building a business and what I get the greatest pleasure out of, building a business where advisors can reach their full potential professional. Um, that's mm. why the business has grown the way it has. We didn't set out to have multiple sites. I set out to build a business where advisors that I could see wanted to give this type of advice, but were in environments that didn't enable them to be able to do that because of the restrictions around them. And they didn't necessarily want to start businesses or build those resources. They just wanted to give that type of advice. So I've tried to build a business that has all of that that they can plug into and we can build that around somebody I identify has the great skill sets to go to that next level and provide them those opportunities. And we have that type of business now. So we're, we're looking for those types of advisors and, and that's mutually beneficial. I mean, that's something I personally get a great kick out of. I coach junior sports and um, I just get such a kick out of being involved in other people's success. Yeah, so if any advisors out there, you're looking at changing your job or claim if you want to get back into advice, uh, <laughs> then you go have a chat to Chris. Office in Vietnam, mate. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, just I guess we're we're quickly running out of time, but I've just got one question. Uh, kind of changing track a little bit, moving to you said goals based advice. How are you? Um, and I'll just preface the question. We did a Sydney event uh, going beyond the SOA, and one of the things um, that we talked about was like capturing clients' dreams and goals, and where like because financial planning software isn't designed to uh, to capture that. It's like what's your super balance, what's your insurance premiums, and um, sums insured. So, what technology are you using to kind of capture that and have that front of mind for the advisors? So the first place I think uh, any advice that I would give on that is really spending a lot of time as an advisor on practicing your ability to have those conversations in the first place. Really good language mm -hmm. and how to get mm -hmm. that information out and have those conversations. Because having good technology or a laminated goals on the fridge is a great post um, that conversation outcome. But we spend a lot of time on how we get there in the first place and then link that back to our strategies. But to answer your question directly, uh, we've got a few tools that we use, but we're now in the process and not far away with software designers of developing something specific to help enhance that conversation with a client interactive. So, you know, program where they can be literally moving their goals graphically and um, uh, onto timelines and um, writing down what those goals are and then being able to lock that away and then being able to access that in their client portal and be able to refer back to that and have something tangible at the end of your conversation to refer back to, but also something for my advisors to use to enhance that conversation. I mean, that's the big one, you know, often we'll be sitting in front of clients and even between themselves, they've never had that conversation because it's not an easy one to have sometimes. So yeah. our power as advisors is to create an environment where you can facilitate that and having some sort of digital program, you're right, Phil, didn't really exist. So we're out there building it ourselves.
Yeah, okay. I mean, you know, my, my personal view is that is the only value that we bring as advisors is having those conversations. You know, almost anything else, the information that we provide on super insurance, it's great. Um, but really the only value that we bring long term is is having those conversations. Claim clearly disagrees I, I, with me. I, I, on the I disagree. I just I disagree, Phil. Um, I think all that information is fantastic and you're right. If you look at it from a rational point of view, you're probably correct. But I, th- I feel like it, with the connection that we make with the client, we then direct that uh, towards the change of behavior. And so we almost personify the engagement with their own money. And I go on, I go on about this a lot. It's like, all that information, as you've said, already exists. And it's very easy to, to get elsewhere. It's almost like um, you know you, you can learn how to do a sit up anyway. You can learn Brazilian Jiu Jitsu just through uh, YouTube videos, but um, none of that matters really. Like one percent of people would do that, and maybe that one percent of people are financial advisors, and so I think it's hard for us to come to terms with that. But majority of people, just because the information there doesn't mean that they'll do it. So I think by having that goals-based, you know, uh, questionnaire not only achieves things outside of money, but it also includes increasing a relationship personally with the advisor and the individual and then using that relationship to get the better outcome. I think that's hugely valuable as well. I think think you're both right. right. I think what we do is we educate. Um, That's a huge thing that we do because it's it's not done in schools and by the time we're coming out, we're all just doing what our mates told us they're doing. So we, through the education, we empower them, but you've got to give the power back to the client to feel like they're making the decision. Um, Having done this for 15 years, it is pretty awesome to be there when people require, um, when they retire, when they achieve those goals because in those early sort of three to five years, you go, I think this is right. But I have been at the end where it works and it's awesome. Um, so, yeah, the goal space and the education part is, is what we do and, and that's the reason I sit in front of clients. That's right. Well, Clay, it wouldn't be a session or a conversation between you and me unless we disagreed. Actually, no, that's wrong. We totally were on the same page. I was saying that is our value as advisors, is doing what you were saying. Um, is yeah, it- yeah, yeah, yeah isn't what we, you know, providing insurance advice isn't, you know, coming up with a recommendation of what insurer to go with isn't our value. Our value yeah, is yeah, yeah. having those conversations, helping clients take action. So we kind of agree, cool. but yeah, we do disagree all the time. But I, um, I, I just prefer to disagree with you, Phil. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You, you pretty much, you just start with, I disagree, Phil, and then say the same thing as me. So that's, <laughs> yeah, I, as long as I get the first sentence in. <laughs> all right we, we, we're getting quickly getting into a bit of chaos here let's finish up thank you so much chris for coming on board My um, pleasure. you know just sharing all your knowledge and all your experience with you know referrals mergers one of my big takeaways actually i like i like getting a big takeaway one of mine was um asking for a client referral after the first year don't have the first meeting and say all right now you know give me another client um you know after the first year you've proven yourself then you can say hey you know is there anyone else to chat to um so that was my big takeaway so thanks heaps chris no my pleasure mate it's been great all right make sure uh next week we've got another xy live um that we've got got them every single week just live streaming on facebook if you're not in the facebook group look yourself in the mirror get in there um and thank you for, again to our supporters aia for um bringing xy live and thanks clayton for coming all the way from vietnam bye awesome. everyone see you guys next week bye see you later chris cheers mate bye